And good morning. Welcome to our service. My name is Henry Ozerny and I'm the interim pastor here at New Life Church in Toulon, Manitoba. The picture on the screen is of last Sunday's outdoor service. It was very, very warm here in Toulon last Sunday. We couldn't meet indoors and so we met outdoors. It was just a few people showed up uh, because of the heat, but we had a great service anyways. And... Uh, we were sitting in the shade of the church. Well, it's an opportunity for us uh, to worship today uh, in this manner, and we want to begin by praying God's blessing on this service. Thank you, Lord, that we can meet together, and we pray that as a result of our service here online today that uh, hearts and lives would be touched and built up and encouraged and brought to Jesus. Thank you for your presence with us. We ask your blessing upon us. We pray this in Jesus' wonderful name. Amen. The intro song was by Reba Andani, and I See Jesus in You. I want you to listen to the entire song now. I used to think how wonderful to have been here on the earth When Jesus Christ, the Son of God, was born of human birth
I see Jesus in you. Reem and Donnie sing about, of course, a love of a husband and a wife for each other in that song. But it's very appropriate to what we're going to be talking about today because I want to focus in on this idea of I see Jesus in you. And we'll talk about that more a little later on. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 2. We'll be reading verses 4 through 10. But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God has raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus, in order that in the coming ages he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God, not by works, so that no one could boast. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Well, may God add his blessing to the reading of his word this morning. We have an exciting new announcement to make, and that is as of this weekend, new government guidelines now permit us up to allow us to have a um, capacity of up to 50 people, uh, 50 percent capacity, I'm sorry, which for us will be 75 people. And so instead of meeting outdoors in the heat, we will be returning to the air conditioned comfort of our church building. And we will be meeting from this point on every Sunday morning at 10 a.m. As a matter of fact, next Sunday, we have a special guest speaker. Our youth director, Miss Emily Green, will be sharing uh, both in our service in church and on our YouTube service. So we're looking forward to that. And then Linda and I would like to say thank you to the congregation for the uh, card and the gift of money, which they gave us last weekend in our outdoor service for our 50th wedding anniversary. We want to thank you uh, for that gift. We have another song by Twyla Paris, I see, Can See Jesus in You, similar to the first song we had. Uh, listen as Twyla ministers to us.
Father Paris, with I can see Jesus in you, I can see his love on your face. Great song. A pastor was approached by a gangster to take his brother's funeral. And this uh, brother, of course, was also a mobster. And the gangster said to the pastor, if you take this funeral for my brother, he said, I will donate $500,000 to your church's building fund. But on one condition, and that is that you say in your message that my brother was a saint. Well, the pastor really struggled with this. Uh, they needed the money for their building program, and that was for sure. But remember, m he began thinking, how can I say this man was a saint? He was anything but it. Well, he conceded to do it, and at the funeral, he made the statement. He said, this man lying in this casket was a terrible man. A mobster guilty of many crimes. He was a low-down cheat, a murderer, a thief, a scoundrel, and a real menace to society. But then he went on to say, but compared to his brother sitting here in the front row, he was a saint. Well, this morning our text is talking about us living such good lives that people could call us saints at our funerals and really mean it. Our text is two verses in 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 12, and then we jump ahead to verse 15 verse 12 reads this live such good lives among the pagans that though they accuse you of doing wrong they may see your good deeds and glorify god on the day he visits us for it is god's will that by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men and so this morning we're going to look at the message that i've entitled live such good lives father in heaven we thank you for the opportunity we have to meet together online in this manner. We thank you for the technology that permits it. And I pray that through this service today that our hearts and lives would be uh, enriched and um, benefited because we have heard what the Word says. And more importantly, that we have decided we're going to go out and make some changes in our lives so that we are living such good lives, that other people can indeed see Jesus in us. And when they look at us, um, they will not see just us, but they will see Christ in us. So we just command every evil spirit in the strong name of Jesus to go. Holy Spirit, we welcome you here. We ask your blessing on us. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. In the movie, Mr. Deeds, played by Adam Sandler, Deeds owns a pizza parlor in suburban Mandrake Falls, New Hampshire. And in his spare time, he tries to sell greeting cards to Hallmark uh, Company. What he doesn't know that he is the only living relative of a rece recently de deceased owner of a global media empire. And his great uncle's death has entitled him to inherit 49% uh, share in, in the corporation, which is worth roughly $40 billion. Well, unbeknownst to Deeds, Chuck Cedar wants to control those shares, and he believes that Deeds is stupid and is trying to convince him to sell the shares to him. Well, Deeds is a genuinely good guy, and he's giving lots of his newfound money to those in need, and, and he doesn't like it, for example, when people curse in front of women. And he is appealing as a character because he doesn't sacrifice his benevolence or integrity upon acquiring this wealth. Uh, he treats everybody with the same respect and the justice they deserve. Although it's interesting, every time that uh, someone is doing uh, something wrong or being rude, he will uh, lay the smack down on them. Well, in, stamps, in steps Pam Dawson, uh, played by Madonna Ryder, and uh, she's a producer for the tabloid program Inside Access. And her boss, Mac, is out to discover Deez's identity, and Dawson goes in as an undercover uh, as a sweet school nurse, and she's playing on what Deeds wants in a woman. And initially, he, she doesn't believe that he, anybody can be this good. And then soon begins to truly fall for him. Well, you know where this is going. Well, the point of our message this morning, uh, first point is this. Our lives should be full of good deeds. Indeed, in our text, we are told that they should be full of good works. Verse 12 begins by saying, live such good lives among the pagans, and then we jump ahead a few uh, phrases, that they may see your good deeds. And indeed, that is what God has saved us for. He saved us for the purpose of doing good works. 
Ephesians 2.10, our text that we read earlier on in the scripture reading. For we are God's workmanship, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Augustine, the, first, uh, the third century uh, church uh, leader, fourth century church leader, said this, Grace is not given because we have done good works, but in order that we may be able to do them. I am saved not by good works, but I am saved to do good works. And so our purpose of getting saved is not just to go to heaven. Of course, it is that for sure. But it's also to do good works after we have believed, after we have been saved. A uh, story is told of a woman uh, who woke her husband up and she said that uh, she was in labor. She needed to go to the hospital. Well, he jumped out of bed and immediately dropped to his knees and he said, honey, let's pray. And she looked at him and uh, she said, this is not the time to kneel and pray. She said, it's the time to get dressed and head for the hospital. She said, it's time for action. Well, it's in the same way, after we are saved, it's time for action. It's time for good works. Titus 2.14, who, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his own, eager to do what is good. I like the way John Wesley put it. He called it John Wesley's rule. Do all the good you can by all the means you can, and all the ways you can, in all the places you can, at all the times you can, to all the people you can, as long as you ever can. Well, that kind of covers every possible potential angle, does it not? You see, it does matter to God how we live and what we do after we are saved. Indeed, he wants our lives to be such that people will be drawn to God and to praising him after they've watched us and seen how we live. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, in the same way, let your good deeds shine out for all to see that everyone may praise your heavenly Father. Notice that you do good deeds not so people will praise you for your good deeds, but they will praise God. And they will see by your good deeds, wow, God is working in that man's life, that woman's life. We can see Jesus in that person. I was reading the story that Joan Yoder tells, how that she was putting a bag, the bags of groceries she had just bought in a grocery store into the car when she discovered there where she was putting at uh, the bottom, uh, uh, at the bottom of the cart, a, a greeting card she hadn't paid for. And so she went back to the cash register and waited in line. She apologized for the oversight, paid for the card. And the man though was there behind her, he was looking quite dumbfounded and he said to her, oh, it's only a greeting card. Who would have known? Aren't you a bit silly to come back? And Joni Yoder says, for a split second, I did feel silly. And then she said, I thought, and I answered him, should you ever lose your wallet, I think you'll hope that somebody silly like me finds it. Well, Mark Twain put it this way, always do right, it will gratify some people and astonish the rest. Remember a number of years ago in the church in Stonewall when I was the pastor there, uh, from 1970 through to 2014, uh, the parents of a woman in our church had come to Canada as landed immigrants. And so for them to live in Canada, uh, they needed to raise a $25,000 deposit for health care needs should they arise. And uh, this uh, couple are in our church family could not afford that $25,000 and they wanted their parents to remain in Canada. And so this came up at a church board meeting. And it was decided at that church board meeting that we would ask the people of the church to contribute to this need. And so the following Sundays, we made the announcement, well, in no time at all, $25,000 came in. I think we even had to turn some away. More than that came in. And it was given as a deposit, put in the bank, and in time, people could get the money back should it not be. But there was no guarantee. Should there be health care issues during that period of time, uh, that money would have been used for that. Well, you know, it was amazing to watch the community, how they responded to this good deed done by our church people. And all over town, people were talking about this. And they were uh, taking note of the fact that we had raised this amount of money to help a couple move to Canada. And uh, one day I was in my office and I got a phone call from one of the, um, actually the editor at the Stonewall Argus, the newspaper in town. And she said, you know, we've just heard what you did uh, for that couple wanting to move to Canada, she asked, she said, can we come and interview you? 
Well, I said, sure, of course. And I remember thinking, wow, um, how many times we call the Argus, oh, we got a good story. We think you, you should come and uh, write up it. We'd have to beg for them to come and do it. And here they're offering it. You see, people see the good works we do and it attracts them to Jesus. I like the poem by Stephen Grellett. I shall pass this way but once. Any good that I can do or any kindness I can show to any human being, let me do it now. Let me not defer nor neglect it, for I shall not pass this way again. I shall not pass this way again. Secondly, our good lives should diffuse false accusation. Now, believers are oftentimes subject uh, to harassment and false accusation. For sure, Christians in the first century were. Uh, the author of Hebrews writes to the Hebrew Christians, remember those earlier days after you'd received the light, shortly after they became Christians, when you stood your ground in a great contest in the face of suffering. In other words, becoming Christians, they received a lot of opposition from family and friends and, and the society around them. And then it goes on to say some of the opposition they received. Sometimes you were publicly exposed to insult and persecution. People made fun of them and, and uh, rejected them. At other times, you stood side by side with those who were so treated. In other words, the Christians were faithful to support each other during the times they, others were going through persecution. You sympathized with those in prison, people who had been put in prison because of their Christian faith, and they went and helped them uh, financially. And notice the next phrase in which I've drawn the cartoon, joyfully accepted the confiscation of your property. And what that meant was in the first century, that uh, if the government didn't like the way you were living, they gave uh, the people around you, you they can go and get whatever you want in their house, go and take it for yourself. Confiscation of property. And then go say, you, you accepted that joyfully because you knew your, you yourselves had a better and lasting possessions, referring, referring, of course, to our home in heaven. So that the persecution and the opposition and the false accusations were some things that Christians in the first century experienced. Uh, in addition to that, first century believers were oftentimes falsely accused by their non-Christian neighbors on a number of things, such as cannibalism. For example, the Christians practiced what they called the agape feast, and that's where they would kind of like a potluck meal, and they would bring their food, and then they would also in the process uh, have the Lord's Supper, uh, eat the bread, drink the wine. And word went out into the community that this was uh, cannibalism. They were actually eating the leader's body and literally drinking his blood. And you remember how Jesus had said, unless you eat my body and drink my blood, you uh, do not have uh, life. And of course, he was talking about uh, his sacrificial death on the cross for us. Well, that was misconstrued in that way. And then there was also all sorts of accusations about sexual immorality. And word went out that the agape love feast was that love. Yeah, it's a sex orgy, they were saying. And then thirdly was the fact that they were disloyal to Caesar. You see, once a year, Roman citizens all over the empire, you could have any religion you wanted to, it didn't matter. But you had once a year burn a pinch of incense and say, Caesar is Lord. And Christians were not doing that because they were saying there's only one Lord, and that's Jesus. They refused to do that. Well, this was interpreted by the society as disloyalty to the empire and to the emperor. And for that, many of them pay the price. Well, these sort of false rumors and accusations still happen today. I remember way back in the 1980s in the church in Stonewall, one of the guys in our church was talking to a fella uptown. And uh, the fellow said to uh, uh, our friend Al, he said, the people over in the Baptist church, they roll around in the aisles. And uh, Al replied, he said, Stuart, that's simply not true. They do not. And he went on to say, he said, I know. I've been going there for a while now, and they do not roll around in the aisles. Well, this was something somebody had made up, and it was, there was not a shred of truth to it. And Al was able to correct that false misperception. Uh, and of course, you know, Satan is the one that's behind these false accusations and these rumors. That's why Ephesians 2, 2 says, according to the prince of the power of the air, of the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. The spirit working in the sons of disobedience is the devil. And the sons of disobedience are people who are not following Jesus. 
Another illustration of that happened back earlier than from the 80s, back in the 70s. One day I heard around town people were saying, boy, when you go to the Baptist church, you better keep your hand over your wallet. Uh, the minister might try to pickpocket you. And uh, the conversation was uh, because the fact that he had stolen a Christmas tree um, from a row of spruce trees uh, along the highway. Here's a picture of that, that row where I supposedly had cut down that Christmas tree for myself. Now, uh, the background to the story was this. We had had a traveling evangelist in our town, uh, a man by the name of Rick Simmons, good friend of mine. I really appreciated his ministry. He had a musical band uh, comprised of his family and several others, and he was holding uh, services at our church. We would sometimes have a Friday night, Saturday night, Sunday night service, Sunday morning as well, and great, great times. We enjoyed it. Well, in there, uh, his 20-year-old uh, daughter, which uh, there you can see I put a circle around her, had befriended a young boy who was getting into a lot of trouble. And they lived uh, in a trailer park, and uh, one Sunday afternoon, this young boy, he was about 16, uh, came over to uh, her place and picked her up uh, on his snowmobile and said, let's go for a ride. And he drove the snowmobile to the, that row of trees on the farm. And then he proceeded, to her horror, to chop one of those trees down. And he said, this is a gift for your family. And then he dragged it behind his snowmobile to her place, left it there, and went. Well, in the meantime, the farmer discovered that the tree had been chopped down. He phoned the police, and the police traced. Uh, they just followed the, uh, the tracks of the snowmobile and the tree being dragged behind it right directly to um, Rick's house. And the police officer went and pointed at that tree and said, I need to talk to you about it. And Rick, who was preaching in our church that evening, said to uh, the police officer, he said, I really can't talk to you right now about this. I can later, but I have to go preach at the Baptist church. Well, the police officer then went back to the owner of the tree and he told him it was the quote unquote Baptist preacher who had stolen the Christmas tree. Well, in no time at all, that spread all around town. Now, here's the question. Who's the Baptist preacher in Stonewall? Well, me. I'm the one. And I thought of that verse in James 3, verse 6. It says, by our speech, we can ruin the world, turn harmony into chaos, throw mud on a reputation. Well, that was happening to me, uh, that experience. Well, when I uh, became aware that this was going around, I went and spoke to the owner. And I said to him, I hear you think I stole your tree. And he looked at me and said, no, it wasn't you. It was your daughter. And I said to him, well, you know, I find that hard to believe, he sa I said, because you see, she's two years old. Here's a picture of uh, my daughter at that point in time, at about two, two and a half years of age. Well, you should have seen <laughs> the look on his face. Well, eventually the rumor died down, of course. Now, one of the reasons we should live such good lives is to render such accusations as being unbelievable. And that's what our text uh, that Peter uh, is, is saying, uh, the way he puts it, uh, that um, verse 15, it says, For it is God's will by doing good you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish people. You see, seeing our good lives will force those people to admit, no, you know, they're not bad. They're actually God is at work in them. Again, that text, live such good lives among the pagans, though they accuse you of doing wrong, they may see your good deeds. That word that's translated, for, the word see that is translated there literally means careful watching over a period of time, not an evaluation made by snap judgment. And as they watch your life over weeks, months, and even years, they come to the conclusion when they hear this rumor, this false accusation, they'll say, no, that's not true, it can't be true. And well, it's our job to make sure it's not true. Now, uh, that's why in verse 15, as I've already read it, for it is God's will that by doing good, you should silence the ignorant talk of foolish men. That's how you put the rumors to rest. You live a good life. And so we should be people who are winsome, friendly, upright, people of integrity, no duplicity or hypocrisy in us, full of purity, care, and love for others, not mean-spirited or judgmental. I put on that list to illustrate the kind of characteristics 
that should characterize our lives, the kind of things that people should look at us, that we are these kind of people, winsome, friendly, upright, people of integrity, no duplicity, hypocrisy, full of purity, care, and love, not mean-spirited and jud judgmental, just a good illustration of the list of ways to be. Like the little girl who was saying her bedtime prayers, Lord, help the bad people be good and the good people to be nice. Well, that's the way we want to be. We want to be both good and nice. But the tragedy, however, is that surveys are showing us that many Christians' lives are not morally or ethically much better than those of non-Christians. They show, for example, the same levels of dishonesty and cheating in school on exams or on income taxes in both Christians as in non-Christians. They say there's virtually no difference. They say there's the same levels of family breakdowns and divorce uh, uh, amongst Christians as there is amongst non-Christians. They also say there are same levels of immorality, the use of pornography and of abuse in Christians as there is in non-Christians. Paul saw this happening in the church in Corinth and he was shocked and he said to them in a letter, 1 Corinthians 5, 1 and 2, it is actually reported, it had been reported to him, that there is sexual immorality among you and of a kind that does not occur even amongst the pagans. A man has his father's wife, which was incest. And he went on to say, and you are proud. In other words, the people in the church say, wow, you know, we're really broad-minded. We're tolerant. Yeah, sure, this guy is sleeping with his uh, father's wife, um, my, his stepmother, but uh, it's great. And he goes on to say, Should you, shouldn't you rather have been filled with grief and have put out of your fellowship the man who did this? In other words, deal with that. That's not a proper uh, lifestyle for us as a Christians to have. You know, it's interesting. I have had non-Christian businessmen tell me that the worst people to do business with are born-again Christians. And I, I, I've heard that, and I, I, I think, how tragic is that? And indeed, this is the exact opposite of what Peter is saying should be true of us. As James puts it in James chapter 3, verse 10, my, my brothers and sisters, this ought not to be so. In other words, you should be the best kind of business person. I, I think a lot of times uh, Christians kind of ex expect uh, better deals because they're Christians and, uh, and that sort of thing. Really, it should rather be that hopefully some of them, by watching our good lives, may even come to believe in Jesus themselves. And so they watch us and then they think, wow, there's something different about him. There's something unique about her. And begin to seek out the God who lives in us because they're impressed by our lifestyle. We see a marvelous illustration of this in the book of John in the New Testament, where Jesus met the Samaritan woman at the well, <coughs> and she had come to draw water, and Jesus had said to her, will you give me a drink? Well, to her, this was highly unusual, and she said to him, you are a Jew and I'm a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me to, for a drink? In other words, uh, the fact of the matter is Jews are not dissociated with Samaritans. That's one issue. And then secondly, she was a woman. He was a man. That was even another cultural barrier he was crossing. Well, Jesus replied to her, if you knew the gift of God, who it is that asked you for a drink, you would have asked him and he would have given you living water. Well, the woman then goes on to say, sir, give me this water so I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to draw uh, water. She thought, man, this is a great deal. And so Jesus said to her, go call your husband and come back. Well, she replied, she said, I have no husband. And Jesus responded by saying, you're right when you say you have no husband. The fact is you've had five husbands and the man you now have is not your husband. What you've said is quite true. Well, when the woman heard Jesus make this statement about her, and he just, he's just met her and he already knows all the stuff about her and all of her marital affairs, she realizes, wow, there's something about this guy. And she says to him, sir, I can see you are a prophet. Well, to make a long story short, later on, the text goes on to say that she would go and tell her neighbors there in uh, uh, that Samaritan town, come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Do you think that he might be the cross? And so despite her reputation, many of the Samaritans took up her invitation. They went out to see Jesus for themselves. And because of what they heard that woman say, as a result, many of the Samaritans in the woman's village came to believe in Jesus. They said, we no longer believe just because of what you said. Now we have heard for ourselves, and we know this man really is the Savior of the world. Well, that's a perfect illustration that a life attracts people to God 
when we live that godly, winsome, beautiful Christian life. I like the way the meme puts it. Live in such a way that those who know you but don't know God will come to know God because they know you. How many people have come to know God because they've known you? Can you think of anybody? Have you drawn someone by your life closer to God? Has someone actually been motivated to accept Christ because they watch the way you live? You live such a good life that they want what you have. One day, a woman came to see me in my office in the church in Stonewall, and she said to me, Pastor, I don't know what's wrong with me. I feel so empty inside. And I said to her, you know, you need Jesus in your life. Well, as a result of our conversation, she prayed that evening to ask Jesus to come into her life. And the following Sunday morning, her husband came along with her to church. And after the service, he came up to me and said, what did you say to my wife? She was totally different when she came back into the house. And he said, I came to church this morning. I had to find out for myself. Well, uh, the good news is uh, he went on to accept Christ as his personal Savior uh, that same day. And they both became part of the church after that. He got involved in playing in our church hockey team. And I actually um, have a picture there of this motley crew of uh, hockey players. And you see me in the bottom left-hand corner there. And uh, we were uh, one hockey game or one uh, evening. Uh, uh, Gord, that was his name. Uh, Gord and I collect, collided at Santa Rice, and he ended up busting my, my finger. Actually, it was this finger here. And they put a doctor put a splint on me, and so I was walking around with my finger like this. That was kind of a difficult thing. Uh, broke it right, right in here. And uh, I remember thinking to myself, well, that was a painful end to... Uh, end result in my witnessing experience with him. Well, I want to wrap it up by saying that the ultimate goal for our good deeds is that they may see your good deeds and glorify God. That when people watch us the way we live, they are attracted to God. They see Jesus in us. And they can see the difference he's made in our lives. A Christian police officer was speaking to a group of Christians in a church one Sunday, and he asked them this question. He said this, if being a Christian were a crime, would there be enough evidence to convict you? Well, that's the question I want to ask you. Do they see Jesus in you? Do they see him in me? Lord, we want that to be true in our lives, that Others can see Jesus in us, and that because they see Jesus in us, they're attracted to him by our lives. Not that they think we're great and wonderful people, but they think that you are a great and wonderful God because you've done this in us. And I pray that you'll empower each of us to live those kind of lives for your praise and glory. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Sandra Enterman sings the song, beautiful song. I love it. Do they see Jesus in me? And as she sings the song, I want you to ask those questions of yourself. Do they see Jesus in me? Is the face that I see in the mirror the one I I do.
Do they see Jesus in me? That's a question I want you to ponder as we conclude today. The benediction for our service this morning, Matthew 5, where Jesus said, In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and praise your Father in heaven. Thanks for watching. God bless you. Have a great day.